Hey everybody, in this video lesson we're going to talk about intermolecular forces. Now you might be asking yourself, what is an intermolecular force? Well, it's a force between molecules. This is not a bond. A bond is an attraction or a force connecting two atoms together. But this is a connection between two different molecules. And so somehow the two molecules need to form an attraction to each other. Some of those are weak and some of those are strong. Now as you can see, there's a video embedded over here, but I can't play it. Mr. Dirksen's video lesson has this video and it helps explain the different types of intermolecular forces that you see over here. There are four of them. But instead of watching this video, I'm going to splice in a video that I have created for a different chemistry class. Enjoy. We are first going to begin with dispersion forces. What you do need to know about dispersion forces is that they are instantaneous dipoles that are the result of electron movement. Anything that has electrons, whether it be a polar molecule or a nonpolar molecule, will exhibit dispersion forces, which are attractions between two molecules. As long as molecules have electrons, and all of them do, they will have dispersion forces. Now, what do I mean by instantaneous dipole? What do I mean by that? Well, these are most often associated with nonpolar molecules, but polar molecules exhibit dispersion forces. We talked about that previously. But a nonpolar molecule does not have a dipole, but it may have an instantaneous dipole when all the electrons kind of pile onto one side of the molecule at any particular moment. Remember that electrons are dynamic particles that are always in motion, and due to just random electron movement every once in a while, they may find themselves all on one side of a nonpolar molecule, and for a moment, there may be a slightly negative side of that molecule and a slightly positive side. Let me illustrate using this example of hydrogen. Now, hydrogen is a nonpolar molecule. It's quite small, and it's just sharing two electrons here. But every once in a while, the shared electrons might find themselves closer to one side of the hydrogen than the other. And this side of the hydrogen would have a partial negative side, and by contrast, then the other side would have a partial positive charge. Now, let the electrons continue to move, and at any given moment, maybe the electrons now are on this side. And now this side has a partial negative charge, and then the other side then has a partial positive charge. Now, if you get two molecules that are exhibiting these instantaneous dipoles at the same time and close enough to each other, they may begin to attract, and if the temperature is low enough, they may turn from a gas, in hydrogen's case, to a liquid. Or, even colder, might turn from a liquid into a solid. You're looking at an illustration from our textbook, and on the last slide, I talked about how just nonpolar molecules could exhibit instantaneous dipoles, but just simple atoms could as well. If it's got electrons and the electrons move, then it has instantaneous dipole, and as a result, could result in some dispersion forces. Now, take a look at two helium atoms here, and we've got helium atom A and helium atom B. Now, helium atom A has electrons kind of randomly dispersed throughout the electron cloud, and so does atom B. And because they're kind of equally dispersed, there is no instantaneous dipole. But in a moment of time, at some point later, maybe all the electrons from atom B find themselves on this left side. And as you can see now here on below in the polarization view, we've got a slightly negative side and a slightly positive side. Now, this atom A still has evenly distributed electrons, and so it is not exhibiting any dipole, but atom B has a dipole. Now maybe you've got atom A and atom B both exhibiting the same sort of situation where all their electrons are piled on to one side and we've got a slightly negative, slightly positive side for atom A and also for atom B. And for a moment in time, there might be a slight attraction. That is what we call an induced dipole or an instantaneous dipole due to just random electron movement. Now we're going to talk about dipole-dipole intermolecular forces. And dipole-dipole intermolecular forces only happen between polar molecules because polar molecules are the only ones that have dipoles. If you take a look at this molecule, you've got CH3Cn, and we've got this molecule with a nitrogen here on the end. Now this nitrogen comes equipped with two electrons that kind of hang out at the tip of this molecule, which means that the molecule is polar. It's got a partial negative side over here and then the partial positive side on the first carbon here at the bottom. When the temperature is low enough, this molecule can line up where its negative side is closely attracted to the positive side of a neighboring molecule. 
and that is the dipole-dipole intermolecular force. It's the attraction between dipole of one molecule and the dipole of another. Now let's talk about hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is something that you were introduced to in a previous chemistry class possibly, but if you weren't, I'm going to describe it right now. Hydrogen bonding is a special case of dipole-dipole interaction in which hydrogen is bonded to either oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine, and when hydrogen is bonded to any one of these, the difference in electronegativity between hydrogen and the element that it's bonded to is so strong that it creates a very large dipole. And so that dipole ability that we talked about on the last slide is very large, and as a result, that increased dipole ability causes an increased attraction to a neighboring molecule, and as a result, you get high boiling points of substances that exhibit hydrogen bonding. Let's take, for example, two molecules that look very similar, but one exhibits hydrogen bonding and one doesn't. The first one is NH3. Now, NH3 has nitrogen in the middle, and it's bonded to three separate hydrogens. It's a polar molecule because it's trigonal pyramidal, and it exhibits hydrogen bonding because it has hydrogens bonded to the nitrogen in the center. And that dipole difference between hydrogen and nitrogen when it comes to the bond dipoles is so large that it creates a very, very large dipole-dipole intermolecular force with something around it. Now, compare that to pH3, where you've got P in the middle with H's coming off, and you still got a pair of electrons on the P. And it's also a trigonal pyramidal molecule. And because it's trigonal pyramidal, it's polar. But the difference in electronegativity between the phosphorus and the hydrogen is not very large compared to the difference in electronegativity between the hydrogen and the nitrogen on its molecule that it's being compared to. The difference in electronegativity, in fact, is so small that it's considered essentially nonpolar, the bond anyway. It's 2.6 for phosphorus and 2.2 for hydrogen, or a difference of 0.4. So it is a polar molecule, but it does not exhibit hydrogen bonding, and as a result, it will have a lower boiling point than its buddy NH3, which would have a significantly higher boiling point. Hydrogen bonding is the reason that water creates these very strong and rigid hexagonal crystals when it freezes. And it's the core of every snowflake. Every snowflake starts out as a six-sided crystal, and which is why every snowflake has six arms. As you may know, when water freezes and creates these six-sided hexagons, it actually expands when it freezes, which makes it less dense in its solid state than in its liquid state. And as a result, it will float on its liquid self. Now, this particular characteristic of water has many, many implications that are hugely advantageous for us as humans to survive and for us to live on our planet, which is 70% water. Because if the solid state sunk down into its liquid form, we would not have ice on top of lakes. We would not be able to go skating. We would not be able to go ice fishing. We would not have any life that exists in the oceans because they would freeze from bottom up rather than from top down. And if they freeze from bottom up, everything would die and life as we know it would not have existed because scientists have hypothesized for many, many, many years that life began in the oceans and moved out onto land after many, many thousands of years. So if water didn't do this, then life would not exist and we would not be here today. The last intermolecular force that we are going to be talking about today is called the ion dipole intermolecular force. And that's not really an intermolecular force, but rather an interparticle force. But we put it in as an intermolecular force anyway. What happens here is that a dipole or a polar molecule has an attraction to an ion that has been dissolved in it. And so when you have something like water, which is your classic example of a polar molecule, which has a positive end and a negative end, and you dissolve ions into it, the positive ions and the negative ions are going to behave slightly differently with the water because the positive ion is going to align itself with the negative side of the water molecule. And as a result, you get water surrounding the positive ion with all of its negative sides, and this is what is known as a hydration sphere. Now, the other ion is a negative ion, and the opposite would be true, where the positive side of the water would surround the negative ion in what is known as hydration sphere, but the orientation of the water molecules compared to the negative ion is obviously different than it is with the positive ion. But this attraction between the positive side of the dipole molecule and the negative ion is what is known as an ion-dipole intermolecular force. Now that you know a little bit more about the different types of intermolecular forces, let's take a look back at the notes. This slide asks how are the different intermolecular forces represented when drawing structures. So first let's talk about how bonds are 
represented. Bonds are represented by solid lines or solid connections between two atoms. So that is what a covalent bond looks like. But intermolecular forces are almost always dashed or dotted lines. Now since these two molecules are polar, this could represent a dipole-dipole intermolecular force. But because I know this is oxygen and this is hydrogen, and oxygen and hydrogen, and the dipole-dipole intermolecular force is between hydrogen and an oxygen on a different molecule, then I know that this is actually a specific type of dipole-dipole, as we talked about a hydrogen bond. But regardless of the type of intermolecular force, the intermolecular forces are always represented by dotted lines. Here's another picture where we have the covalent bonds represented by solid lines and the intermolecular forces represented by dashed or dotted lines. Finally, this table is going to summarize all the four different types of intermolecular forces and their relative strengths, and also which type of molecules would exhibit these. So first, London dispersion, which are considered the weakest in all molecules, whether it's nonpolar or polar molecules, exhibit these types of forces. Because remember, London dispersion forces exist because electrons move, and when electrons move, you get those induced or weak dipoles, and those weak dipoles could be on anything, whether it be nonpolar molecules or polar molecules. Now, dipole-dipole must be polar only. Only polar molecules can be attracted to each other using dipole-dipole intermolecular force. Ion dipoles, well, as the name suggests, an ion, whether it be positive or negative, has to be attracted to a dipole. So you have to have at least one polar molecule and one ion. And to compare these two to each other, dipole-dipole and ion-dipole, we can't really compare them. They're just middle-of-the-road strength. Finally, hydrogen bonding is the highest or strongest type of intermolecular force out of all of them. And it has to be a polar molecule where the H is attached to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Only then can hydrogen bonding in a form of an intermolecular force exist between two molecules. Now, why is the strength important? Because the strength of the intermolecular forces affects many physical properties of the molecules. And you can be sure that we're going to be talking about the different physical properties that intermolecular forces play a role in. Well, that takes care of this video lesson. Thanks for watching.